Welcome to the Penobscot River, a stream that tears through the heart of Maine, connecting mountains to the sea. It's the largest river system in Maine, draining 5.5 million acres, delivering ecological benefits, cultural enrichment, and opportunities for recreation. This trip, we would take canoes down a historic stretch, camping on its riverbanks and reveling in its beauty. We even had the opportunity to speak with locals like Peter Crockett. They would enrich us with their stories of growing up in the region. I'm doing what I can to bring people like you to see this, just to see what how beautiful it is. You know, and the more people that see that and realize it, maybe there'll be more voices besides mine. But life on the Penobscot has been tumultuous in the preceding centuries, and that's exactly why Old Town brought us out here. We have the story where a couple of Penobscots were fishing for salmon with a sharpened stick. It takes place in a stream called the Sawatahunk Stream. It, that means a stream that flows between the mountains. And what's really interesting is they were fishing for salmon, which today there's no salmon that far up the river because of dams. There are hundreds of dams in this watershed to create a head of water to run the logs. For 169 consecutive years, the forests have resounded with the sound of the woodsman's axe. If you had a stream that you were cutting a bunch of lumber on all winter and you've stacked these logs on the, the banks of the stream, you want to be able to hold the water back as long as you can so when you push those logs in, then you, you flush them with your dam. And so there's all kinds of those dams that were built all over the watershed. The floodgates are open. The pulpwood bolts are put afloat. And once again, New England logs and pulpwood bolts begin their tumbling trip to the mills miles away. Much advance work had been done on the stream beds to facilitate the drive. Obstructing boulders had been blasted, snags removed, and low banks blocked off. The Penobscot story is one of resilience. The river once flowed freely for more than 100 miles from Maine's highlands to the sea. Myself and a group of adventurers were going to learn about its fascinating history and what's been done recently to execute a massive restoration project. Canoeing is new. I haven't done it in a long, long time. But the first step was getting reacquainted with a canoe. I'm used to paddling a kayak like Alex here. But fortunately for me, my partner was Joe, and he was a former professional river guide. So he took me through a few strokes that we would need to conquer rapids downstream. There we go. A little surf session to warm up on the Penobscot. <laughs> the river was deceivingly swift and pushed us deeper into the wilderness. And as we continued onward downstream, it was apparent just how lush this landscape was. Yeah, this is sweet. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. I feel like I'm paddling in a garden. Oh, yeah. This is amazing. The hues of greens and blues contrasting with the dark river was incredible. Seemingly out of nowhere, our Penobscot guide instructed us to pull over and hike into the woods. A birch bark canoe was being made by his tribe only a few hundred yards away. The canoe is made from a single piece of bark without a break or defect in any part. Sometimes we would take the canoe itself and take a piece of bark and make a ramp and the fish would swim and then swim up the bark and then land in the canoe and be trapped. You won't find a single screw or nail either. Only natural materials like wood and roots are used. You're fishing at a time when there's a lot of fish. They're coming from the sea and they're coming in like shad. They're coming in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of numbers. And so trying to capitalize on on that. There's a moon that shows up nowadays around the end of February, early March the moon that provides a little food grudgingly. So it's like starving times. So it's at the end of all your provisions. And so when it's fishing time, it's like, okay, we made it. And now all the food is coming. Even though the river is stained, it's still very clean and very clear. tackled a few swift water sections and pushed forward to our next stop. We just canoed up to Sugar Island. This is gonna be a cool place to swim, have lunch, and also get a really cool history lesson. Looks like a 
So right now we're going on a walk across Sugar Island, uh, Penobscot Nation Island. So here's an example of the birch bark that we saw on the canoes. Our lunch spot was right next to these birch bark wigwams, which would have acted as houses for the Penobscot as they made their winter migration from the coast up to their family hunting grounds. But as we chowed down on lunch, James began talking about the severe pollution the Penobscot River endured for the past century. So we had uh, a lot of problems with dioxin here, which is a cancer-causing agent because of people wanting white paper. The water's the brown of paper and textile mill waste. The Indians called this river of many fishes. They wouldn't call it that now, and they wouldn't eat the few fish they could catch. Because it's the bleaching process in mills at Lincoln, which is north of here, East Millinocket, which is north of here, and Millinocket. At the turn of the 20th century, construction began on the world's largest paper mill in Millinocket, Maine. The small town of Millinocket grew at a feverish pitch. They were using elemental chlorine to bleach, and a byproduct of that uh, polluted the river with dioxins. In 2008, the mill shut down and stopped releasing into the river. So this is probably one of the most monitored rivers in the country. We have a water quality lab. We send out people every single day to do tests in the river, completely testing the whole watershed in one week and do that every week. So if there is a problem in the river, if someone dumps something, we know about it. Yeah. There we go. Right on, paddles up, brother. <laughs> So can we like reload and do that again? <laughs> All right, we've made it to camp. So we just finished our first day's paddling on the Penobscot River. Got our boats drug up on land. It just seems like around every single bend on this river, there's a new view and it's amazing. Wow, there's an overpowering smell of mint somewhere. Probably mint and poison ivy. <laughs> this is actually part of the Penobscot Paddling Trail. But this particular campsite is on private property. The owner is just down with having paddlers camp here, which is really cool. I think something that could be implemented on other river systems. Okay. The sunset produced a vibrant reflection across the river, welcoming us to its banks and definitely setting the mood for camp. It was going to be a wonderful evening and the festivities had yet to even begin. We regaled about favorite sections of the river and recounted stories James and others had shared with us. Joe even picked some wild blueberries for us to enjoy before the lobster bake. We sparked up a fire and left the rest to Peter. I purchased some lobsters off the boat, which means like noontime they were just coming up from the bottom of the ocean. This is their natural environment. Referred to as rockweed because I think mostly it attaches to rocks. He's gonna taste good. <laughs> Peter is a longtime resident of Maine and even grew up on its coast. He's done many a lobster bake on the beach and wanted to bring that same famed cuisine to us on the river. The rockweed's moisture and saltiness permeates through the lobster, steamers, mussels, and corn. Throw wet canvas on top and melt some butter. No seasonings or additives needed. It's time to scout a camp spot. It's just so pretty back in here. In the views of the river. I might come in over here. So this trip we're going to be in the Eureka Summer Pass 2. Yeah, this is a sick tent. The lobsters were looking great and we were definitely hungry. Time to put them on the plate and crack them open. We started off dinner with some light conversation, but that quickly silenced because everything was delicious.
Good morning guys, it's about 6 a.m. but up here that means the sun is shining. So I'm on a sunrise mission to capture this really cool fog. We had a peaceful morning at River's Edge, watching the fog float by and drinking coffee by the fire. Before long, it was time to pack up camp and start covering miles, because we were going to be learning about one of the most innovative river restoration projects here on the Penobscot. Walking away from Peter's campsite for the last time, but for now, we're going to go load up the canoes, set off down river, go explore some more. We pushed off from shore and pointed our canoes downstream through the braided river. It didn't always flow freely like this, and that's where the restoration project steps in. The Penobscot River Restoration Project was a collaborative effort to balance fisheries restoration and hydropower production in Maine's largest watershed. This unprecedented and innovative project raised $63 million to remove two dams and build a state-of-the-art fish bypass around a third. For the first time in a century, Atlantic salmon and other sea-run fish have access to nearly 2,000 miles of their historic river and stream habitat. This rebound also provides food for many fish-eating birds and mammals, including eagles, porpoises, and river otters. Making our way to Old Town, looking at bald eagles, hunt fish. There's like three off in the distance up there. This project stands as a model of cooperation, innovation, and hard work for the benefit of nature and people. Heads up, Joe. Coming in hot. My personal journey on this river was one of enlightenment. It's so easy to visit destinations and rivers and not realize the historical battles that have gone on. This trip will give me appreciation for every place I paddle from here on out. Once again, thanks to Old Town for bringing us out here. Guys, that's gonna wrap it up for the main trip. Catch you all in the next one.